I am with Ron Perlman, the famous Snyder Pretzel King and fantastic war gamer in 54. But I hate, you know, I got to say, his claim to fame should be the Battle of Gettysburg. Ron, can you tell me about your experiences in that movie? Uh, that movie, uh, like a lot in life, was, was luck. I was, as a reenactor, going to give them a day or two a week um, due to uh, just a uh, duty we feel to the uh, making history presentable to the public. I went up on a Thursday and um, some of these people in what's called the second unit knew me from previous productions that I could, um, I was crazy enough to do crazy things on horses. I, I helped them out with a scene that um, was they wanted the horses galloping close, and then he asked me um, if I was available for the summer. Didn't have a great job that summer. I said yes, and it went from there. I was hired to work um, the whole summer, and um, the very nice people in what's called second unit managed to every week give me and 11 other guys who had special skills stunt money one day a week they made some excuse made some way or another they were able to do that um, one guy a manager of burger king in uh, baltimore could do a backflip standing straight up and just do a complete backflip hit on he got they used him for some special scenes paid him stunt money at least one day a week and me some horse um, activities and scenes most everything is out of the movie because the budget on this movie and all the planning on this movie was for a TV miniseries. I think they first started with a $12 million budget. It went higher as more and more reenactors came, showed up, especially on weekends, and more great scenes uh, were, were shown. More great scenes were put out in production and uh, slowly but surely a little more money came in and uh, that built the quality of the movie. Uh, but of course, from the very first, uh, the whole production was stifled a, a little bit and it was budgeted as a TV production. I think the original plan maybe was 10 hours or, or of an hour and a half, two hours per night. But that particular time period, the miniseries was losing popularity. And um, in editing, a few months after that, the decision was made to make it into a movie. Um, most days in movie productions, they just do one side or the other. Everybody's a confederate or everybody's a union. Um, I was, again, quite lucky. Then the few days, especially in Little Round Top, that they were showing both sides, they gave me all the people that just showed up on their own, were not reenactors. I took them to the trailer and got them outfitted, got their Indian fiberglass muskets in their hand, and that was a, a great fun to um, lead uh, a contingent up on the attack, and it was the one furthest away from the camera. Uh, interesting, something really interesting about movie productions is that all the talk scenes are done first. So many actors will be there for two weeks or a month. That's it, they're done. While the production may actually go on for four or five months. Another interesting thing I found about movies is that there's a scene that the star has a chance of being hurt. That's the last scene they shoot on the very last day. An example, Kevin Costner in Dances with Wolves, him riding through the buffalo herd the very last day of shooting. Because um, he gets hurt on the very last day of shooting, it doesn't affect the production. An interesting side note on that, uh, a couple of summers ago when I got to ride horses and Little Bighorn Battlefield, a pro gentleman that owned the horses, supplied the horses for the Dances with Wolves movie. Uh, very in, very interesting time. But, um, well, Ron, I have a question. Were you helping out with the Confederate side or the Union side? Most of my horseback scenes were the Union side. But the way movie productions work is most days you're only filming one side or the other. 
So one day, everybody, all the reenactors, all the people that are just showing up, and then some days we had 50 to 100 of them. People that are showing up uh, just to say they were in a movie or just for the experience. There is a fire academy uh, that uh, teaches school for firefighters all the way across the nation in Emmitsburg, Pennsylvania. And from that academy, we had 20 to 60 a day show up. And I believe that was okay with the fire academy because it was a draw to get people to come for the training. But most days, you are one or the other. Once in a while, uh, you don't. People don't have a uniform for the other side, so they have to go to the uh, trailer to get a part of their outfit, at least from the Confederate or the Confederate or Union. What the movie people would do to put those in the back ranks, and so you didn't see uh, that. Another thing, an interesting thing at Gettysburg. First couple of weeks, because of experiences in the previous two summers, almost no reenactors were showing up because two summers in a row we had been built up, that big thing was coming, and then here comes the summer and last minute, no, changed their mind. So um, it was week three or four before we had a decent number of reenactors there. One uh, thing that seen it and the scenes that were not perfect and there's a lot of them in there and we all know it for example the guard at the very first of the movie we used him because he could, he could talk well and we didn't have 20 we didn't have 20 reenactors on that particular day so we used him um he didn't his uh, weight to height ratio was not confederate looking very much but at first um that's, that's what we had to do. Uh, the movie people, of course, concentrated with the stars on all their talk, talky scenes, and that's all done, and those people those people leave. But um, only about a third of the time or less are they filming both sides in the same day. So you just you show up and you find out, usually the day before, whether your neck is going to be Confederate or Union. Big difference in a movie Gettysburg from most productions is rather than have a screenplay, it would be almost this is a little bit of an exaggeration. It would almost be tomorrow we're going to do page 124. We're going to do the discussion of da da and da da da, and then this Union unit is going to march down the road. And that you knew that that's very different than, than most productions. Uh, that rather than a very formal screenplay, is that. You do, uh, you do, you know, what page are we on tomorrow? So, Ron, what was that Confederate artillery bombardment like on the field? Two, two interesting things about that. Number one, and, and people uh, have actually, and this is even war game as historians, what BS, the, they went down the line, one cannon, the next cannon, the next cannon, the next That is historic. You do that so you're going to have a continuous bombardment on the enemy. If you go down the line, one, the next, the next, the next, the next, and then when you get to the end, the first at the other end is ready to fire. That is to make sure the bombardment, there's no lulls in the bombardment. Um, you fire one, that was the reason for that, and that's the way it was done historically. With 100 and some cannons at that day, they probably only went down the line until the, they knew the first one was loaded, even though there may be only 30 down the line. And then they came back and, and, and went. And, and, uh, we could reload these guns in about uh, a minute to two minutes. I know what history books say, but um, it, take, it took us that long. We couldn't do it fast enough, even skipping one of the steps. How many guns were there in the movie? Uh, we had about 60 of them, to rep representing, uh, I think it's a, about over 100, 120, but I believe we had 60. One interesting thing, to me anyway, that one of the, maybe, I think maybe two, but I'm sure one of the barrels in that reenactment not only was an authentic Civil War cannon that was used in the Civil War, an original, not a remade, but it had been captured. It was a Union gun captured by the Confederates at Gettysburg and recaptured 
in Spotsylvania a few months later, and then 150 years, 140, 50 years later, it's in the movie. Of course, the carriage wasn't the same, but I find that very interesting. But the two, at least, was original. Ron, I, I have another question. What was it like to mingle with the movie stars? I don't know which ones you met, but do you have any stories about them? Most of the movie stars, uh, some of the uh, some of the nights uh, partake of um, adult beverages at a place called Fonsworth House. Uh, they knew me because I was running around uh, on uh, horseback a lot, even though all my scenes were cut as a lot of great scenes from a lot of people. They're normal people. The, the gist is that the movie stars that don't mind doing what they call dust movies are pretty much just like us. It was just like having a meeting of a buddy at the bar, let's say you played ball with um, a couple hours before, and having a cold one and having a, and, you know, having a good time. And as people do, talking about sports, um, maybe the opposite sex, that kind of thing. Uh, they're just normal guys, um, just like us. Um, the only um, stipulation to that was um, Tom Berger, just for example, told us later he'd never played a historical figure before, and he took it very seriously. Uh, now, as soon as his talk part was over, changed completely, extremely personal, extremely fun to be around. It was just the first two or three weeks until his talk scenes were done. And he did not show up at Fonsworth's house those weeks. But then we found it was only because I'm playing a real person. He has, that real person has relatives. That real person has admirers and detractors. I wouldn't do justice to that real person. But as soon as uh, the close-ups and the talk scenes were over, they were great. And all of them, all of them were great guys. Uh, I think, um, I think there was only maybe one or two that were a little uppity um, at first, but um, and but Maxwell talked with them, and it was basically dollars. These great actors here are saving us millions of dollars a day. You be nice, you be super nice to them, and etc. And I was only one person who mentioned his name, but anyway. Um, that the movie stars are just like everybody else. Just like everyone else. All and, right. Um, the, it's, it, it's a bear on the fake beards, but after all, it was a, it was not a major movie production. It was a TV production. That somehow, luckily, um, it was a great director, a big effort from a lot of the stars, and the stars loved it there. That they told me last October, they can't think you know, very, very rare cases where a cast and as many crews can get together had a reunion 30 years later, which we did last fall in Gettysburg. Well, Ron, I'd like to ask, what was it like at the 30-year reunion to close out our video? Um, what really impressed me is, um, and my wife big time, is that Stephen Lang walked by hundreds of people up to shake my hand because he remembered me. He didn't remember my name, but I was called Killer because I, when I was in Confederate, wore Ori Main red double breasted shirt. And he remembered Killer as soon as I said Fonsworth House. And that was a, a big deal. The, the reunion was great. The stars were great. It was interesting to know what they were doing now. It was very interesting that Maxwell's speech to us that what movies Gettysburg and Dodge and Generals were doing in streaming because he gets all these numbers and they're doing great. COVID and home viewership seems to be the thing for historical movies of long length. They work better there. They didn't do it in the theater even. And um, both Gettysburg immensely and Dodge and General somewhat uh, has got good, have gotten a great following on streaming services because historic movies, if they're done right, don't age. All right. Well, thank you, Ron, for this interview. Uh, Ron Prilliman, did I get the... All right. And world-renowned war gamer and um, 
I really am appreciative of this interview. Thank you. And everyone, stay safe, be kind, and be courteous. And thank you, Bill. Appreciate it.